Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I am a little bit. I am a little bit overwhelmed. <laughs> um, yeah, because uh, most of my stay in Germany has always been in the periphery. So whenever I come to the center, I have to take a little bit of time to get myself used to. And it's all about the refugee or asylum policy in Germany, is to keep people within the periphery. Cut off and it takes them seven, eight, nine, ten years. It took me 17 years to come back to the center. So uh, it's an opportunity for us to say what has been our experience as refugees in Germany, but not only as refugees, but people who have tried to see what we can do from our perspective to um, bring a little bit of solutions to the refugee problem, even though um, we are a little bit disappointed that the civil society has not taken a, a bold step towards this kind of concept. My name is Chueben, and you are? I am Ima. Ima. And I came to Germany in 1998 and asked for political asylum and I was sent to a place called uh, Eisenhutenstadt and actually in Eisenhutenstadt I had to go through the normal process of I call it normal because most refugees go through this process which is fingerprinting, photographing uh, removing your shoes, wear the fingerprint, all the cameras, the barbed wires. And soon later, we started realizing that it was more about fear. It was more about intimidation. And we started getting a little bit of information on what asylum really means in Germany from the legal perspective, which is uh, that you are, you are very much restricted to live within a certain area and that you are not allowed to get contact as easily as possible with the civil society. And after three months in this place, I was sent to a place called Muchenberg, which is an Obergangswohnheim. And it's actually not in Muchenberg, it was actually out of Muchenberg in a, some kind of an abandoned building, a former military camp. And we started, I started talk, calling the others and asking them if they have the same situation like me. So we found out that um, the situation was like that to everybody. And when I came to this camp, I was told that you are not allowed to go out of this district. You are supposed to use food vouchers uh, you are not allowed to work, you are not allowed to go to school. And we couldn't believe that, I mean, being in a first world or a democratic country like Germany, just because of your statue, you are not allowed to go to school, you are not allowed to go through a certain area, you are virtually every motivation as a young man, as a young woman, to want to grow is systematically being destroyed. And we couldn't accept this. So we came together, some few of us, and said we should form some kind of a small structure from the refugee perspective to go out to our German friends to explain to them essentially what is the laws on refugee, particularly dealing with the their living conditions on, or how they survive on a day-to-day -day basis. Not just about reading the law, but how do we survive? And um, we spent a lot of years, we did a lot of demonstrations, we did a lot of workshops, seminars in the universities, going around and talking. But after two years, some of us found out that 
um, we are easily pulled out there to go and talk about our problems. We do a lot of actions. But when we come back to these socially quarantined places called Ubergang Tvonheim, we were completely cut off. We were weak. Most of our friends don't really know where we live and what is the real situation. And so me and some of the others, we said, we should walk, we should try and empower ourselves. We should look on a structure that has to, we should develop a concept that has to do with pulling the civil society from the center back to the periphery where the refugees live. And parallel to that, I used to have phone calls or sometimes from my family in Africa. And they'll say, Eben, can you give me your, telephone, your email address? Because email is cheap. Mobile phone is expensive, we can't call you. And I didn't know how to tell them that where I'm living, I don't have access to a computer. Actually, I've never touched a computer. And I found it a little bit shameful that you are in Germany and you've never used a computer or you, are, you cannot access a computer. And I talked to some of, uh, some of our political friends, some young students at the Technical University in Berlin, that how is it possible that I can go and learn how to use a computer? And they told me that, uh, well, Eben, there is a little place in Berlin at that time, around 1999, 2000, uh, in Grunberger Strasse, to call it low tech. And that you could go there and explain to them that you want to learn how to use a computer. So I went there and, and talked to them and said that, well, it's not only me as Eben as, uh, uh, that I have this problem, but I found out that many refugees have the problem. They want to, you know, communicate with your family, get information, just basic information on how you can um, find your way out in a, in a, in a in a new environment. And they said, well, we have only five pieces here. You could come here and actually come and learn how to create an email, use a computer. So I went back uh, to the student and said, well, I live in Brandenburg, and I don't know how to come to Berlin. So they said, well, then we'll see how we can help you. And that's how the five first refugees came to Berlin to group Begastrasse. For three months, we learned how to use a computer on basic things, create an email, how to access search engines, get information. And then our idea was that we should go back to the Heim and see how it is possible for us to install or put such communication access within these spaces and to help the majority of the refugees. Um, and that's how, um, that's how we actually went. After three months, I got the knowledge, and then I went back to the Heim. At that time in Potsdam, there was a, there was a Heim lighter who was a little bit more open to refugees. And so I explained to her that this is our idea. We want to create, we, we need a space in the refugee homes to see how possible it is for us to bring, uh, to install communication access. And I asked her, is it, is it by law in Germany that refugees should not have communication access within their homes? And she says, no, there is actually, there is no law. The problem is that who will pay for it and who will take care of it? Because they don't want, they don't, they want less work in the homes as much as possible. And so I said, well, we've answered that question. We can take care of it ourselves. And we don't have a problem of who will pay for it because our supporters are going to do that. Then there was a third problem we had to write to the administration to explain to them exactly what we want to do. So she says, well, I will help you formulate the letter, and we can write to the Auslander Beholder to say, well, we don't want to form terrorists. It's just for people to get information and that. 
And so we wrote, and they accepted. And that's how with our friends, with students, we, we also had to write to the, 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 the trigger, the people who actually are running the Heim, to get their permission. At that time, it was Malteza, and we wrote to them. And they accepted, because we wanted the concept to be very free from the administration. So the, in the Cooperations Fair and Barum, or the contract we wrote with the Traeger of the Heim, is very explicit. We wanted them to give us just a room, only a room. It means we had to put our own connection, our own internet connection, where the computers were brought by us, it was given to us by our supporters. We did the, we installed them with, uh, with Linux, with Ubuntu, and we had to run the internet cafes ourselves. And uh, they accepted the contract. And so we took our boreholes with our friends, and that's how we succeeded in building the first internet cafe in the whole of Germany uh, in a Flüchlingsheim. And then it progressed to other places, Luckenwald, Prenzlau, Bad Belzig, Berlin Marienfelde, Berlin Hellesdorf, Eisenhutenstadt, Rathenau. Now, uh, now, our idea of creating the internet cafe, as I explained before, was not, is not just an internet cafe. It's because we found out that there is, we had to devise a means to bring the civil society into these so-called uh, socially quarantined areas. We were looking for a means to break the isolation that we are not only pulled to the center to come and do demonstrations and seminars and explain our problems, but how could we bring you into these places where, not that we are much comfortable, but that this space is, is actually a free space for us within a control space. Because the Heimleitung cannot come into those places without our permission. We, 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 we had the power within this space, and that was very important for us and it's still very important for us. Um, I would say that why do refugees need internet most? I mean, um, there are so many reasons I can state tonight why refugees need internet the most. They need it for information. Basically, arriving in a new environment, an environment where legally and also in, in a very high degree, the civil society is very not so welcoming, very patronizing, and sometimes really um, very obstructive. On the other side, you have a very difficult legal situation where you are not allowed to go to school, you are not allowed to move out of the district, you are forced to live within a very difficult environment. They need it so that they can get information, at least basic information about the asylum process, networking with their families, having possibilities for alternative education. Why is it very important for refugees to have these spaces. If you look very well, the idea of us trying to build the internet cafes is very much in the direction of empowerment. Empowerment, we were trying to find a means where we could, within this very difficult context, have a space where we could then start to become participative in the German civil society from our perspective, where we could uh, start bringing little bits of solutions from our perspectives, where we could orientate ourselves very much on various things that we will hope or we will wish to do 
in the future. So we were trying to derive a means into this very um, difficult places that we could, in the little opportunity we have through the internet, to develop skills. And I bet you, you all know you are experts on the internet, what refugees could do if 14 years ago since we started. Now the government is a little bit afraid about internet and refugees because there are lots of things they are realizing politically can be done. But in the beginning, when we started, we showed more about the social aspect of giving access to refugees. And there are lots of things we could have done from the inside, and which I will talk a little bit in the little means we have, what we have tried to do with the internet, apart from just having computer classes, uh, we would have created a lot of platforms. We access in refugees emancipation with the internet cafes we have, uh, about two to 3,000 refugees every day use the project. Imagine um, if we had developed alternative platforms or refugees creating their own platforms within the spaces to reveal their situation, how they live on a daily basis. Imagine what could have been the multiplicator effect. Um, not that people, I do encourage people to come from outside, but it would have been great to have this concept of internet cafes within the refugees' home, backed by politicians, because actually you don't need anything from the Heimleitung. If we have the political support to push in the agenda of independent internet cafes within refugees' homes, we could have used it as alternative forces to reveal how people sleep in the rooms, what is the sanitary problems in their homes, the kinds of food. We could even help refugees before they even do their interviews. Um, because we make a lot of mistakes because of lack of knowledge on how the asylum process goes. But if we could install, as we have done in Eisenhutenstadt, there could have been possibilities online to help refugees, to communicate with lawyers, to give them instructions on what they have to say and what they don't have to say. All of this is possible um, to be done. Now, this is what we have done. But um, we've had a lot of difficulties. I have been in a situation where I've gone to a Heim. A Heim Lightroom has called us and said, please, we've heard about this very good project. Can you come and put an internet here? Well, he thought in his mind that refugees emancipation is a very big German organization, and probably the, it's a white guy who was the coordinator. So when I came, he was surprised that actually I was an African and that I could not even speak German. And immediately he changed. He said, well, um, if I allow you to put the internet here, are you going to install something that I can control all the emails? And I was shocked. But I wasn't really shocked because I already know the mentality because I've heard from a lot of officials being scared about refugees having access to internet. And I told him, well, we can do that in refugees emancipation. And you have no responsibility in terms of anything that happens uh, when the refugees use the internet because we have a cooperation fair and barroom we have a contract that clearly states that we are responsible. All your responsibility you've got is to give us the space. And that's all we need. Now, why is it very important that we build a space? Uh, it's important that we build a space because, as I said before, refugees have to feel that they are participating in a process. It's important that you don't also have this feeling that you are just coming to the home to give something. 
And I think that once our experience has shown, once there is this participation from the refugees, when there is this acknowledgement that this project is their project, we will, you will realize that we will not have much problem about thinking that computers will be missing or you know, having problems of what many people do think or from the administrative side that it's insecure to have these hardwares in these places. I think on the other side also, um, it's important that we acknowledge that when refugees have these spaces, they feel, and they know they run it, and they know it's their own. They feel more secure also on using, on putting information which is very personal to them. We have been, uh, we've been a little bit disappointed that after 14 years, we still have very limited asylum homes with internet access. Actually, if you look at the percentage, I'm not sure it's up to two or three percent. Why is this happening? Why is it that the civil society has not seen a very important instrument that we should not only have discussions about the laws, but we should find a means on how we could empower refugees through the internet. Why is it that we have not tried to go into these isolated places and try to develop a concept from within, you know, that can expose the daily living conditions of the refugees through the internet? Why is it that we are not able to form refugees who can then develop various platforms from within. Because if you carry a camera and go into the Himes, virtually the Heim lighter gets immediately frightened and will not allow you. But refugees, if they are formed, and if they have the knowledge and the basic support, we could produce all this information from the inside. We could give you live pictures today from an asylum home from parents with six children living in a six quadrant meter or a 10 quadrant meter room. You could see all these things live from inside. And our plea, plea today is that the internet or creating internet cafes is a very important instrument in the fight for the rights of refugees. Our plea today is that you can see on how you can support refugees emancipation or how you can build such kinds of concepts within the area that you do live. And as I've said, it is very practical, it's easy. If you go as an individual, it might be difficult. If you go as just supporters, it might be difficult because the administration will look at you as a third force coming into the home to challenge them. But we could build forces within. We could encourage refugees to create self-structures. And these self-structures could then be supported from outside, which means that we have to find a means to really empower refugees. It means finding a means to provide them with basic necessities, especially how do you stabilize them to stay in an area, to follow a concept, to follow a project? Not only political propaganda, not only going to one demonstration and coming back, but how do we find a means to run a permanent project like an internet cafe in a flushing Bonheim? I believe very strongly that we could break the knot from the inside, but you have to disempower yourself to empower the refugees. You have to be fully motivated because empowerment is not a one-day thing. It's a permanent engagement. And when I'm talking to you tonight, I want you to see that the concept of refugees accessing internet has to be a permanent support, has to be something which you have to, be, you have to commit yourself 
on trying to give them this knowledge, trying to allow them to come to the civil society through this new development, new platforms that they can. It's easily done by everyone if they are given the knowledge. I problems. How can you support us? How can you support a concept like refugees emancipation or any other concept which has to do with empowering refugees? From our experience, we have seen that there are many times we have approached and said, all we need is for you to give us a, an empty room. That's all we need. But they say no, they refuse. We try to ask the reason, they bring all kinds of reasons. We don't have space, it's not possible. Uh, the people here will steal all the computers. We say, well, it's not about you running the internet cafe. It's about us running the internet cafe. But they still refuse. And I think that that's not fair. Internet is not a luxury. It's a necessity, especially for refugees. So how do we push politicians around the areas that we do live? How do we develop a political concept to make all asylum homes independent of their own decisions that refugees, so far as you can give them the support on how to get the hardware, how to pay for the bills, and how they can run the places themselves, why should it become an obligation for every home to have such a free space? So there is this political support which is highly needed and which you have to commit yourself um, to push the politicians that they can push the Heimleitungs. Why am I saying politicians? Because I have seen situations where sometimes the Heim administrations are positive, but the community or the politicians being afraid of a negative reaction from the community on saying that refugees are free, they have internet for free, they have everything for free. They put a lot of pressures on the Heim trigger and the Heim lighters are changed. And they start becoming negative. They start putting more restrictions on the refugees. So it's important for us to have the political support and to make the concept to become part of a political decision when they are building a Flushlingsheim or any Flushlingsheim which is already built and that they should have a space for internet for refugees. I think this is number one, which is very important. Number two, how do we now try to see how we could then use this space for different forms and ways that refugees could develop their own platforms. It's, it's very important that, first of all, the people have the concept that this is our space. And so much of the things which you're going to do has to be given to them, or they have to take the responsibility, which means that it's it's very practical to call refugees and say, well, guys, come together. And what do you want for yourself? Is having internet in the home a good idea? And I bet you everybody will say, that's a perfect idea. And then you can say, OK, if you need more information, you can invite us from Refugees Emancipation to assist. Or you can say, well, we want to form a working group within the refugees. And from day one, the people know that, OK, we are making the decisions about our internet space. And I think from there, the demand or the desire to have an internet will come from inside. And they can then now maybe approach whatever, whether it's the Heim administration or it's the people from the administration. They aren't. This 
working group would create a positive atmosphere from the refugees. And I think stage three, of course, will be the practical ways on how then can we make it possible, which is the materials, giving the materials, human resources, which we find sometimes very difficult to get. Because, um, as I said, empowerment needs commitment. So if you say, Eben, I want to come to the Heim in Eisenhutenstadt and help the people to see how they can use the internet to get basic information about the German civil society, to access lawyers, or for whatever platform, maybe teach people how they can write their articles to, they don't, their articles don't need to be written by third parties to journals or whatever. Then you need to commit yourself, time and money, to go to these places. So we need, and we find that lots of people can be politically active, but when it comes sometimes in terms of empowering people, it's difficult for them to be engaged for a long time. Definitely we need finances. There are lots of problems for us running the Internet Cafe as a self-organized group. We are not very much implanted. There's a lot of very difficult patronizing. There's a patronizing mentality in the civil society. Refugee organizations are most of the time just for mobilizing as mobilizing agent. Eben Kanslu Mishan Palm and Rufen for in a demonstration. And um, when you start occupying space from our experience in refugees emancipation, when you start becoming a refugee organization that you are developing a structure and you are you started to really creating such platforms where refugees are independent, then certain groups start feeling very uncomfortable about the space you are occupying and the power. Um, so we have a lot of problems as a self-organized group. We have language problems. We have financial issues. There are many people where sometimes we like to do things ourselves. That's part of our empowerment. There are many foundations or stiftungs sometimes when we call, and I can't express myself in German, it's just closed. It's real. Most of these things are there. Most of our support comes from students virtually from students. And as I said, sometimes we really feel um, sad about this because we are actually working with the grassroots. We are actually bring, bringing solutions to the people who really need it. But the reaction from the civil society has been very lukewarm. We've got a lot of support, but it's been very lukewarm. And we think this is, this is not supposed to have been like this. Um, it could have been better. And that's why we are here today. We are here to say it is possible to work with refugees to develop concepts in which they can install internet cafes that can bring solutions to thousands and thousands of people. Story of the I had, an, I had an experience with a, with a Heimleiter, whereby we said, okay, we have a small internet cafe. It was just about 10 computers for 250 people. So we needed a beamer. And since he is exposed, because none of them, none of them, that's why most people don't even know about refugees emancipation. None of them, when they have visitors who come to the home, they say, yeah, we are having here an internet cafe to explain that they are better than other refugee homes. 
but they never say that the internet cafe is organized and installed by refugees themselves. They never say that. So I had explained, I said, since you are always receiving people from outside who wants to donate, we need a beamer, and we don't know how to get a beamer. So he said, her shoe is kind of problem. She says, OK. So he called me one day and said, well, Heshu, I've got a beamer. Can you come over? So when I came, I saw the press was there. Um, and we took photos. And they, they, gave, they brought a big plaque written there, 2,500 euros from Lotto. So I took the photo, I held the plaque, and I, 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 they got me the pictures. And then when the journalist went, and he said, Heshu, can you? Uh, can you give it to me? I said, why? He said, well, it's for us. I said, why is it for you? He said, well, they have given it, the check is for us. We will buy the Beamer, and we will install it in the internet cafe. And when we need it, we will use it. We will take it. When you need it, you will use it. So having an experience on their mentality, which is they are always finding a means to get into the room, to get into the internet cafe, to control who should be the fair and votely share in the internet cafe. I knew already what he was trying to do. So I said, well, I have told you that we are a le registered, legal registered organization in Germany. And if you want to give us something, give us as a gift. We don't want anybody, anyone, to put something in the internet cafe which they will use as a means to interrupt what we are doing in the internet cafe. And so since the check has been given to you, it's not very fair of you because you know what we stand for. And I told you in the beginning. I just give you this as an example of how even when we have an internet cafe, how difficult it is to run it from an independent perspective. How difficult the idea in the whole, sometimes from the civil society, but also from the administration, how self-organized group could then become or go into the center stage and expose their situations or occupy a space where they can feel comfortable to empower themselves. And I have many examples. Um, I don't know. I would just say that the internet is such an important instrument. Creating platforms or free spaces in the uh, refugee homes for refugees for their empowerment is very important. And I say it is possible if you put a lot of um, interest, if you come out and really say, we want to do something about this, and that it is possible. And I've just tried to explain to you, I don't know if I missed any point on, yeah. I would like to talk about what is our future perspectives. I think I already said some things about them already. Um, definitely, we want to create the internet cafes as a free space, but as a space where, and it is a space where you don't have to go through the Heim administration to come to the internet cafe. You have no binding to go through the Heim administration to come to the internet cafe. It means if you are coming to Eisenhutenstadt, you don't need to go to the Heim administration or to the Auslander beholder. You come and say, I'm going to the internet cafe, and you come directly to the internet cafe. So what are we trying to do? We are trying to create a space whereby you can come directly with an idea, with a concept, and say, OK, Eben, this is my concept, or this is what we can do together, and see how we can make this space a space to empower people, a, a space where people can alternatively um, acquire knowledge, a space where we can exchange 
exchange knowledge. We are trying to use the advantage we have in having internet cafes in the Himes to build apps, for example, whereby refugees can download these apps to have basic information on how they can um, have their way around the German civil society or how they can get interview um, translations, how they can be accompanied to the foreign office, how, um, what is the nearest place where they can get alternative health attention, how can their children go to schools. We think that we have this advantage that we are already in these spaces. And if we can develop such a concept, it could easily um, spread. And this can become an important tool for refugees to use in Germany. Um, there is a, from the CCCB, there is a support group which will definitely talk to you in details on Sunday. There's a campaign, yeah. The campaign will be started in September. Yes, there is, there is a campaign that will be done, I think, end of September, end of September, September to talk to you more in details how you can, how you can support uh, refugees' emancipation, whether it's as I said, financially, politically, material, human resource, or otherwise, or to come to the IM or contact us and see what concept you have that we can use the internet to um, give this concept to refugees. But we have a website also, which is uh, refugeesemancipation.com. You can, if you go to contact, you can get our email address, but you can also give us a call and maybe we can talk in details what ways you want to help us now. And on Sunday, Sunday the 15th, yeah, they come at the, at the bare dome. Um, there will be a discussion on, uh, from the support group of refugees emancipation on how you could support the project. Um, as I said, we are here and we will fight. Say it loud and say it clear. Refugees, Refugees are welcome here. <laughs> say it loud and say it clear. Refugees are welcome here. Say it loud and say it clear. Refugees are welcome here. Say it loud and say it clear. Refugees are welcome here. Thank you. Mithilfe unserer Computer und Smartphones können wir jeden Tag mit Freunden, Familie und der Öffentlichkeit kommunizieren, uns informieren, wenn wir nicht mehr weiter wissen, etwas Neues lernen und uns weiterbilden, uns verabreden und organisieren und uns endlos unterhalten lassen. Stellt euch vor, das wäre keine Selbstverständlichkeit mehr. Haben die Flüchtlinge bei Ihnen Zugang zum Internet? Nein. 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 Nein, nee, direkt nicht. The social arm day and job center they don't give us too much money. So we are not being able to go outside and to buy something for us like internet packages. It's so very hard, you know. You don't have any contact with your family. 
the, the internet cafe brings all these people together they exchange experiences and then there's this intercultural exchange which is very important for their self-confidence and um, how to move on in the asylum process refugees emancipation is the best thing that has happened in berlin Brandenburg. internet is not a luxury it's a necessity especially for refugees with very difficult legal situation for the past 14 years, self-organized group Refugees Emancipation has been trying to do this. Let's put our hands together to make it happen. Let's do it now. So, as I didn't even need my timing cards, we have a lot of time for questions and answers. So, please, if anybody has a question, go to the microphone on the left and on the right side. And I will call you up then. Let's start at that corner. Hi. Uh, I want to thank you very much for reminding us to listen to what other people need. I think a lot of times we bring technical solutions without um, knowing what those needs are. I had a couple of questions. Um, one may have been answered because I came in late. Uh, I'm wondering what these refugees do have and do with mobile devices. Uh, and then my other question is, um, I'm obviously from the United States. I'm wondering if you're aware of similar movements in other countries. Your question is, um, what do refugees do with uh, mobile devices? And if we have such a similar movement in other countries? That was right, yeah. Yeah. Um, my answer to this is, I come from a purely activist background. So in terms of true statistics, I might not really be, be correct. But from my experience, is that um, mobile devices is not as common as people might think that all refugees do have mobile devices. They don't have mobile devices. And I think from uh, when you talk to most refugees, uh, they don't bring anything, or most of it is taken away from the, from, from the port of entry. And very few of them have the possibilities to buy these devices here. So I would say it's, um, to me, it's about 5% um, of refugees who could have mobile devices. But we have had exp uh, our experience in terms of refugees using mobile devices. Um, is that most refugees from, they watch a lot of, um, uh, they talk a lot with their family, they watch a lot of entertainment from their home countries, music, or do some video stuff. And this needs a lot of download, and uh, it's very difficult for them to really um, have complete uh, access to the internet. Um, I would say that um, it's not really a very, uh, we cannot really go into conclusion. It's very difficult to say that all refugees have got mobile devices. That's not true. As I have said, it's difficult. The second question is that um, about the, do we have similar movements? It's, it, I think uh, it's not easy to do a project from an empowerment perspective because the situation of the refugee is very fluid, it's very unstable. And that's one of the challenges in refugees' emancipation, is that we have to run an everyday project, years over years, where there are lots of very complicated things involved. You know, the materials, people are coming, sometimes it's their first time to use the computer. So we always have 
mouses which are broken, uh, keyboards broken, hard disks broken. You constantly need someone to go to the homes as a technician to do the repairs. Um, we don't have that kind of money, uh, and, and that's part of our difficulty. You have a situation where you have people from 30 different countries meeting in a room, and they have to run this space within a very difficult environment where the Heimleitung plays on a Beni Wiwi policy, which is uh, refugees who can report other refugees who are dangba, are given favor. So there's a lot of conflict. And uh, we have to manage a concept from a very independent perspective. I would say that refugees emancipation is only on its kind in Germany and Europe, as I know. We are the only project that has come out with a concept which is on an everyday basis within this very highly... Con Actually, we are the only organization, alternative organization, running in a Aufnahme Centrum, which is a reception center in the whole of Germany. Uh, w there was one organization that tried to install internet in uh, München, the Aufnahme Centrum, and they were rejected. Uh, we are the only organization, and we've done it in Eisenhutenstadt which can be a big help to refugees to support them before they can even do their interview on very important issues. So I would say that, to the best of my knowledge, Refugees Emancipation is the only organization that has developed and implemented and that has run it for more than 14 years, such a concept. Second question, please. Uh, hi. Um, could you give an uh, example how you collect uh, the money on a regular basis uh, to run a uh, internet cafe? Uh, your question is how we collect the money to run the internet cafes. As I said, all of our money comes from Spender and all comes from students. Up to down. And that's why everything in the organization is done on a voluntary basis. And it makes it more difficult because we get far costing for somebody, we, we bring him to Potsdam, we train him for three months on how to run an internet cafe, and then the next day he has an opportunity in Hamburg, he's gone. And we have to look against somebody, so it's, it's, a, it's all we have got is comes from student. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the civil society has an issue when it has to do with a self-organized group that is trying to build an opinion. And this is the whole thing. Can refugees have an opinion in the German civil society? This is the question we have to ask. Are people afraid for them to occupy a space where they can refer to and say, this is what has happened in Eisenhutenstadt? But to answer your question, all our money till now comes from Spender, from student organization. Um, then I say a question right after that by myself. Um, where can we throw money at you? <laughs> what did you ask? Your question is where I'm from. Where can we? How can we throw money to you? Okay. <laughs> well, uh, we have a website. If you go to the website, you will see our account number, and you can give us donations to our account. We are a Ferrari which means that we can always issue back um, Spender Quitum or whatsoever. You got something to add? Uh, yeah, uh, second uh, question. Um, how, you, or how do you organize uh, the Internet Café, for example, in Eisenhüttenstadt? As far as I know, it is an uh, Erstaufnahme. Yeah. And uh, I think the people there will go away after a few weeks or months. How do you organize that, that the Internet Cafe uh, runs these what, years? What, what we did was, it's, it's very... I was in a Flüchtlingsheim for seven years. I stayed seven years in this country and in a very difficult time where you could not do anything. Actually. I got a scholarship. I did not talk about myself, but the Auslander Beholder rejected me to go to school. 
that was a personal motivation in turn, trying to seek from the civil society what ways I can alternatively build myself. So I, I learned through political engagement how to connect. Now, when we went to Eisenhutterstadt and told authorities we want to install an internet cafe, they asked the same question. They said, it's not possible. The people here just stay for uh, one month or three weeks and they go away. And they're going to steal everything. They are dangerous. They are not good. So I told the authorities, you don't need to worry about that. All we need from you is to give us a free space, give us a room. The rest we're going to take care. And as I said, I had a meeting. I called all the refugees. We sat down and I said, guys, do you want an internet cafe here? And they said, yes, we want to run an internet cafe. I said, okay, if we want an internet cafe, then we're going to do it ourselves. So, of course, I gave them the, the Cooperation Sfeambarum, the statue which they read, and it gave us responsibilities for anything like fire, insecurity, illegal downloads, or what you can think the administration is worried about. I said, legally, you are not in charge of the Internet Cafe. The Internet Cafe is owned by Refugees Emancipation. And we, together with the refugees, from that beginning in terms of participation, they also participated in terms of installing the programs, doing the connection. And that's how we started. Then we have a meeting, we say, what are the rules? What rules do we want our internet cafe to have? People said, we don't want people to drink, we don't want people to smoke. Okay, who are the people who are gonna to volunteer to be as a responsible of the internet cafe? We had one guy from Africa, one from Syria, and one from, uh, I think, from Afghanistan. And that's how we started. And soon after we built a tradition, and the refugees, when, you are being transferred, you form the next one. And up to six years today, going seven years, that's how we run the Internet Cafe. That's how we run all the Internet Cafe. Once you've implanted into the mind of the refugees, once they know it is their project, they hand it over to the next. And that's how we function. And the coordination takes place from the office. So if a computer is broken, they send us an email, and then now we write to one of our German supporters who say, we have a problem in the internet cafe in Eisenhutterstadt. And then they say, okay, Eben, I will have time in two weeks or in one week. And they go to Eisenhutterstadt and they do the repair. That's how we function. That's 2,000 something people, 15 but, computers. Yeah. There are about 2,000 people in Eisenhutterstadt. We have about 15 computers, which is the only place where the refugees can meet. It's the only place where they share information. It's the only place where people do not go along with the policy of the system, which is to make people be isolated. And if I'm a Cameroonian, I walk only with Cameroonian. If I'm Syria, I walk only with Syria. But in the Internet Cafe, people are able to come together and share with one another experiences and different things. Another question? First of all, thank you guys for your excellent work. Um, we're doing something very similar, so we uh, five folk in Hamburg supports refugees, uh, and uh, I was wondering if you could give us advice, because you made one very important point when you said uh, integrate the refugees to, give them, to empower them, give them the feeling it's theirs, and they can do whatever they want, so how do you do that exactly, what kind of tasks do you give them, or uh, what do you do to give them the feeling that it's, it's their cafe, and they are in charge. Okay. The, the, the question was, uh, uh, you people are doing a similar project in Hamburg and giving refugees internet, and how can you give them the feeling of empowerment? Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's... Through our discussion, you realize that we talked about giving refugees internet, but as a self-organized refugee group, our main objective is how then can they use the internet in terms of empowering themselves, politically and individually. What you can learn individually, but also politically. And we think that the participative side of it is very important. 
because we've tried with wireless. We've given wireless, but we realize that people stay in their room and they do download for 24 hours. And they continue with this, the, 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 the line of the policy of the government, which is to isolate people, and they go to this same channel, they go to specific channels which the government wants them to go to get information. And what we are trying to say, there is a lot of alternative information out there, but you need a space where you can come together. And so what I would say is that it's good to build an agri group. It's good to fortify this agri group. It's good to make them to participate from the beginning so that they build this confidence that it is their thing, it is not given from outside. For let's the uh, second last question. I, I, I want to invite you to uh, come to the hacker spaces and to take part in the other kind of self-organized community of the people who are alien in their own culture that, that feel a bit strange and they gather together and, and organize themselves in so-called hacker spaces or hack labs and uh, it would be wonderful if the refugees and hackers could mix together and not stay separate. That, that's my invitation. And the second thing is, in Holland, where, where I currently live, in Amsterdam, there is this movement called We Are Here, which is the undocumented asylum seekers that were kicked, supposed to be kicked out of the country and they don't have anywhere to go. So they are also organizing themselves and having the campaign to say, hello, we are not invisible, we are actually also living here. And uh, it would be nice if you can connect with, with their initiative. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the invitation. And um, I think that that's one of our goals. One of our goals is, unfortunately, we could come here only the two of us. I am not, I'm not a technician. Actually, I'm an activist, and all I do is develop the concept, look at the political situation, negotiate with the higher administration, uh, to try to organize the refugees that we continue with the project from our perspective. But there are lots of refugees with a lot of knowledge about computing. Lots of. And we can do wonderful things if we have your support. Building our own statistics from the Avname Centrum on what, how people can be directed into these alternative spaces. But we need your support completely. So I would say that Yes, these are concepts which can be developed in the future. On the other question, yes, we would like to network with other groups uh, in Europe and elsewhere. And the last question. Yeah, not a real question, but a small reminder, as Chu already said, we're going to meet on Sunday at 15 o'clock in the BER dome that's over there and uh, try to bring people together from the, camp, on the, from the campsite who work in refugees group uh, to share experiences and see how we can work together with refugees. Not, it's not about charity, but working together from my point of view. And we'd like to invite everyone here to come by and discuss with us. So I now close the talk and please give me a very, very warm applause for Chu and Dima. Thank you.